So <clears throat> this is this is filler anyway, right? So so uh, how many people have uh, written some Erlang code? How many have written no Erlang code? You're here just to find out what this thing is. Okay, so half. Okay. So I'm changing the topic. The point was to cover Erlang sort of as an impromptu filler for, for the slot here. So, all right. So the pressure's off. I don't have to, like, hit, hit any balls out of the park or anything like that, right? You guys are going to be easy on me with my 15 minutes. Um, so what I want to do is, is um, there's actually two parts here. This will introduce some Erlang syntax, but it will also get into a, uh, a functional refactoring pattern that I've started to adopt for the last couple of years, which I think everybody here should religiously follow. It's, like, really important. So please pay, pay, pay close attention because your lives will be transformed by this talk in these 15 minutes. Okay, so this started out with, this is a talk I gave in OSCON um, last year, and there's a parable here. We don't care about parables. I'm just going to jump into some, um, some code. The, the basic gist here is um, when, you, when you are writing code, there's, there's sort of two phases. There's just get the thing to work. Right? Solving problems is hard enough. Like identifying problems is hard enough. Solving problems is hard enough. Don't worry about beauty. Don't worry about correctness. Don't worry about, like, sort of, you know, making sure everything is, is, is pristine. Just get it to work. Once you get it to work, you can understand it. And then you can ask this question, what, how is it working? How did I get this thing to work? Um, and then you can focus on clarity. In this case, if something isn't obvious, make it, make it obvious. So this is a very simple methodology. You get something to work. You say, okay, ah, it's working. Uh, then why is it working? And you sit there going, ah, what is, what is going on here? And then you rewrite that code to make it completely obvious. All right, I'm done. Now we'll do an example. So here's an example. Everyone can see that. Um, yeah. So how do I do this? Okay. So there's highlights here. All right. Here, this is Erlang, and this is this is a good example of why people don't like Erlang. I mean, you can, kind of, you can kind of look at this, and then it's like those stereograms where you just let your eyes go real relaxed, and you start to see three-dimensional images. And then, that, then the code starts to... Okay, so this works. And this, was, this is actual code written in Cloud Music that was running in production for a while. And so it's like, whatever, it works. But no, 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 we don't do that today. It works, and now we look at it and say, what's going on here? What is this crazy block of code doing? As it turns out, it's actually fairly simple. I'm going to break it down here. There's really, there's really three things. So let's, the, the gist of this is right here. Right? So what we're doing is we're creating an array. Sorry, this is, this is the skip the head one. So, we're, so let me describe what this does. So if, there, if there was documentation for this, I would say, this is handling a list. Sorry, let me back up a bit. <laughs> it's important to understand what your code does. It's also important to understand the context of it, especially when you're looking at it for the first time. So. Um, this is an actual AMQP message handler. Uh, good old AMQP surfaces here. Um, and what's going on is a request is being made from outside a server. So a bunch of servers are running. We want to know what applications are running on that server. That's the simple, it's just what's going on. So we send a message to the server saying, what, mes what apps are running there? List the apps for me. That's the handler for, the, for this message. So it's supposed to just do a, grab some apps and return a response. And that, that's what this code is doing. So let's break this down and, and, and show you. The driver here, oh, I'm pointing that. There we go. Uh, the driver is this. This is really the most interesting part of this implementation. And it's buried in the stereogram. Right? You really would have no idea unless you just looked there for a long time. So we do that. We look, OK, what's actually, what's the driver? That's what the function does. It returns information related to some apps. So stacks, Java app server, some module. Don't worry about it. This is Erlang. Colon is the delimiter. Their list is the function. So it lists it. And then it's going to do something with that. What's it doing? Well, it's taking the result, and it's putting it into some adders. Okay. You, can see, you can already see that this is kind of bad, like adders. What is it? Adders doesn't mean anything. It's kind of strange. And then it, it's form, it's. Come on now. Here we go. And then it's returning the response. Those are really the three components to all that code. So once it's, once it's working, and I sat there looking at this, why is this code so complex? What's going on here? Those are the three things. So step three of the process is once you understand what's going on, make it obvious. So this is what I wanted to say. Handle apps list. So let's read it as a story. It's dramatic. First line, what does it do? Well, it's, it's listing the apps simple. So we went from like 
really, really terrible, like complex, ridiculous Erlang code to that first line. I mean, that first line reads really nicely, doesn't it? Apps equals some module related to apps list. Eh, and it's not hard. It's simple. Erlang isn't bad if you just take a moment to say what it is that, that you mean. Okay, so that's sort of the big part of the story. Then we're going to return some sort of response right here. Right, we don't have to worry about the details. And so this is, in, this is represented by this function. So I've taken the two primary story items here and put them on separate lines. Now I might want to re rename this to a different something that reads a little bit better, whatever. It's still readable. It's a lot more obvious as to what's going on here than, the pre than, this, than this monstrosity. All right, so let's dive into this. Okay, the, the nature of the response here is, is taking some, this is, a, this is a, a list comprehension in Erlang. You wouldn't know it because it's buried in here. But this is a list comprehension. It's being driven by the list. And we're taking some attributes and we're creating an array. And this is, what, this, is, this is what's feeding the response. Now, this is confused and weird. And, and after, after looking at it, it's just like, this is incoherent. This is really what I'm talking about here. I want to create, I want to wrap up the, 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 uh, the message response. And this is some implementation detail you don't have to worry about. I'm taking some result and I'm conveying it as a response. But what's, what's important is I have a translation layer from the apps list response to this message response. And this is, this is what was completely lost over here. It doesn't show up anywhere here. By creating a function called apps list response, that's the response to the message. I'm defining it as a message response here right, with some further level of, of translation. So I'm starting to spell out in greater detail what it is that's actually going on here. Now I look at this, and, and it's two lines of code. And there's some brackets, and there's some commas, and there's some letters. It's not that hard. And this is Erlang. This is the worst language, and this is the most hideous syntax that you've ever seen in the world. It's terrible. Much worse than JavaScript, or Java, or Ruby, or Perl, or Assembler. It's the worst. But this is actually not that bad, I don't think. I'm right? It's not bad. You guys agree? It's, not, it's pretty nice. OK, just made a function. OK, so now what's this apps adder thing? Well, that's, so that's the work that's going on here. Right? We're, so we're taking some app, list of apps, and we're translating it into some apps adder array. All right, you might debate and say, I don't like that name, apps adder array. It's kind of weird, and it's got the underscores and whatever. But I mean, at some point, it's hard to name things. I think that's fairly clear. It's apps adder array. It is. It's an apps adder array. But what does this mean? Even if this is very confusing, we can still take this. It's, we can we're taking this sort of crazy logic here, and I'm going to turn this into a function. So here's apps adder array, right? And we can answer even though even the, you may not agree with this name, but let's just say the name isn't clear. I don't know what that does, and sometimes I run into that. This is a single line implementation, so it's very easy to answer the question: What does this thing do? You don't have to read the documentation; you can just read the single line. I'm going to read this for the first time in a while. Stack service make array. All right. That's, that's consistent there, with some list of apps adder that's a function of apps. Now, I haven't seen this in months. That makes sense to me. I'm creating some sort of array here. I don't know what that is, but it's, it's a function of apps. Well, let's take a look at the next thing. We have apps here. Oh, there's my list comprehension. But it doesn't look scary and monstrous like it did before. It's, so, it's super easy. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm enumerating. I'm running through apps. For every app, create an entry called app adders. It's starting to get really clear here, isn't it, to me anyway. So apps adder is this. It's a nice three-line function. It's breaking apart some, don't, don't ask me why it's called service, please. Um, it's legacy. <laughs> it should be called app. Um, but OK, I've got name, ID, reserved, and now it's creating an, oh, wow, that's what I mean by app adder. Uh, OK. So even though it might be a little confusing, this code is easy to parse and read. All right, so I think. All right, so this is the non-obvious version. This is the stereogram. And it's fun to imagine what it does. This is the refactored code. And what I like about this method is that at every point in this whole list, you can look at any slice and reason about it within about 10 seconds. So I think a 10, 5 to 10 second rule is a good rule for understanding code. 
Now, it took me a lot longer than 10 minutes to understand this. Or 10 seconds. Yeah, it probably took me about 10 minutes to, to read this, seriously. Probably about 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes. Maybe not that long. Let's say 4 minutes. That's a long time. <laughs> so this stuff, after I've done the work to refactor that, just to bang it into shape, like what is going on here? Let's make it really obvious. At any level here, I can say, what does this thing do? OK, it creates an apps list. Then, OK, that's the response. OK, fine. I know what it does. It's creating a list, creating a response, returning it. I don't have to know what all the details are there. But if I am interested in that, I can just go to this level. Oh, what's the response? It's a function of a message response. OK, what am I doing here? I'm translating this apps into something called an apps ad array. I'm not really sure what that is, but I kind of get that. Oh, what is this then? I'll just read this thing. Oh, OK, it's uh, creating an array, apps adder. Oh, there's a list comprehension. Oh, boom. And you can literally write, you can write your entire program using this method. Now, what's really cool about this, other than the fact that it's understanding, understandable, and things like, why is this called service when the function is called apps adder? That, that steps, like, if you looked at this, would, would that question have ever come up? You'd be like, God, I'm just glad this thing works. <laughs> I'm just glad that the test passed. But you wouldn't be reasoning about anything. You'd just be happy that you can move on to something else. But here you're like, wow, this is really convoluted. Um, this also, incidentally, the payload that was being generated up here has nothing to do with the storyline of this function. It's an, some stupid attributes thing. I don't even know what this means. What I really want is an apps. This is a function of listing my apps. Why do I have adders in here? But if you go over here, it's very, very clear that this response is a function of the message, the apps, and the state. This is a, a um, state is a, uh, an idiom within uh, Erlang programs because there's no global access to, to state. You get past your state in callbacks. So this is long-running state that a process manages, but the facility above the process manages that in this loopy thing. Uh, you get, if you study Erlang, you'll figure out that. Just consider this to be long-running state associated with the process, and you get it conveniently in these callback functions. So don't worry about state. That just gets passed along for context. But you know, this is very, very straightforward. Now, what's here, So here's what I found to be a true benefit of this, apart from actually being able to read your code. Where is a bug going to hide here? Where is a bug going to hide here? Oh, bugs are going to hide in that thing. Bugs are going to hide and grow and fester and breed because there's so much space. It's like having food all over your house. This is where this is gonna, there's going to be bugs here. But where is there going to be a bug in here? If there's a bug, and there very well may be a bug, it's going to be hiding in a line of code someplace. It's going to be, in a, and you're going to have a nice logical wrapper for this with a single one, two, three lines implementation. And you say, oh, this is why this is a bug. You can reason about, is this a, is this a poorly conceived function? Is it simply input error? But it doesn't have a place to hide. And maintenance of this code becomes really, really beautiful. You can approach code that you wrote months and years ago having no idea what it does, not reading the documentation, go to this and say, oh, it's obvious. And indeed, that's been the case. I have found this, that is the real benefit. Because working code is working code until it stops working. And then you go back, and then you're just like, oh, I hate my job so much. <laughs> and this is Erlang, the worst language in the world for syntax, right? I don't know. I think that's pretty nice. I think it's nice looking code. Yeah. So add here one thing. Uh, one should be wary and very careful uh, trying to uh, make second variant from the first one. Because uh, really, second variant is obviously looks much pretty and much easy to read uh, and much easier to reason about. Uh, but uh, for any Erlang developers, it's obvious that uh, such variants they are not equal and they can perform different results for different inputs. No, that's not true. You can mechanically refactor that, and you can prove it. Yeah, you, can sure. prove, you can prove that the first code is exactly the one to the second. I'm talking about exact this, this, this code. Yeah. Uh, the second one will uh, work differently from the, sec from the first variant, because uh, if you show the, uh, the code, uh, this, yep. yeah, it, I don't know how to name this. Uh, but, uh, Stereogram, uh, the white noise. When you use a least comprehension and you try to match uh, ser service uh, record, uh, this least comprehension will work as filter 
and it will just skip any output from stacks Java app server. Uh, so the, the first variant will skip such variants and this right, that, that, that's one a good will point. fail. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. It will fail. So there's some subtle there's some subtle behavior in the way list comprehensions work, which is one of the reasons that list comprehensions can be a, can be something you you might want to avoid. Um, in this case, that wouldn't I don't care about that in this in this particular case. Yeah, but that is that, that okay. So the the point is that in theory, by refactoring, you might change the behavior. True. By changing anything, you might change the behavior. So you do have to be aware of, of doing this. But I'm much happier reasoning about what you just talked about here. So I could easily have just taken this code and put it up here, right? Um, or I could put a, I, I could make this more explicit. I could use a different uh, idiom here. I could use an ac accumulator uh, rather than list, list comprehension to make that translation. I could use, um, uh, what would it be, uh, a map, a uh, list uh, map, list map function. Would, would be another way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. So yes, you have to know the language that you're working with. You have to know what's coming out of it. But the result of this is far more discernible and reasonable, you know, facilitates reasoning and, and, and that type of discussion than this thing. I mean, here, well, how do you even have, like here you, you can even just mention the function name. I mean, just, just sitting here, we can talk about this far more reasonably than this thing. It's just like, oh yeah, you saw that little bit of code in the middle here. Um, incidentally, if you take a ram, if you, if you throw a dart at the wall of Erlang code in GitHub, you'll see this code all over the place. You rarely see this code. And that's too bad. We should work to try to change that. Um, in Erlang community and, and in other functional languages really lend themselves well to this. It's difficult to do this in C where you have a lot of facility around managing memory and pointers and it, you, can, you can get close to this, but it really shines in functional languages. It's a, it's a mechanical refactoring that is driven by your understanding of what the code does. And then you make the code obvious according to your understanding of it. And this is true. I've been using this, this technique for a couple of years, and it's, it is really fun to do. It's a nice mental process, and the reward down the road is the maintainability of the code is, is an, an order of magnitude more, more is an order of magnitude improved in terms of time, efficiency, and quality. And you can just use Wrangler to do this. You don't need to have to do it by hand. Maybe, yeah, could yeah, be. But you do, you're not into that sort of well, the, the the problem with that is I change name. I mean, you're spelling this in a very sort of human oriented way. I would further refactor this. I would have changed this today. So I did this a while ago. Uh, what would I do differently here? Uh, this one here. This function up here. I would have wrapped that in something else. This to me is like too jargony. I would have said list. I would have said list apps, and I might have put that list apps right here. Oh, let me show you this. Just, just well, okay, just okay. Let, let's let's let's. So this is good. Let me just do this. You can also do that in Wrangler. Well, how do you tell it what your what your emotional preferences are? How do you like communicate? How do you talk to it? How do you say you know? Here's that's what you have a wife for. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so let's let's go through let's go through this exercise, and this is an example of where like an automated tool isn't going to help you here. I don't think. So here are three variants of the same thing. So this is something, right? I could have spelled it this way. I'm going to, and this isn't that bad. So I'm going to reply apps list response. Okay, I'm with you. Function of message list apps function of state and state. I'm kind of with them there. I kind of follow that. That's not that bad. Um, I don't like these trailing things. It starts to look funny to me, but that's okay. You know, this is a lot worse code in the world than this. So if people don't like the sort of nested, the problem with nesting to, in my mind is your brain has to kind of keep track of, okay, okay, okay. And at a certain point, your brain is going to give up. And the really smart people are going to like be able to go like 15 levels or 12 levels. I give up around four. I don't have the mind. I, I literally, I cannot remember a phone number of like seven digits. I can't. Something's gone wrong with my brain. So I like you use Google. I'm like a stateless machine. I just like inputs and outputs. So this is okay because it's less than four. But let's say it isn't. Maybe you just like one thing. Fine. How about just pull apps out so I don't have to have this. This is one step. You know, you know whatever. This could be a long function name. And so this, this becomes a little bit better. But this is what I ended up with. And this is probably what I would have written today. List apps, apps list response. And it just sort of spells it out a little bit. Slower pace, just kind of keep it straightforward. You get the advantage of naming these further with a variable, so that helps sort of document 
in, in a way. List apps, apps, okay, ah, oh, good, I get that. I'm listing the apps and I'm, it makes total sense. Um, this response, reply dichotomy is a little weird. Maybe I call that a reply, but whatever, that's really getting neurotic. Yeah. If you do it that way, then your debugging is more intrusive. If you've got functions and functions, and at any stage you have to put a debugger on it, mm. or an IO format, you have to rewrite. Mm -hmm. And unrewriting it is often, when you get the brackets wrong, you don't get a function you've never Yeah, that's a good point. So having liminal functions was a real case. Um, and the other reason that you should try to do this in the team is because it's an indicator of so many human factors in your team. If your team are producing clean <coughs> and aesthetically pleasing code, you have onboarding, you have training, you have mentoring, hmm. you have a whole number of soft processes required for quality, and you can measure it by looking at the code. If you walk into a shop and it's full of fuggy airline, you know that they're all sorts of things are wrong with the team. And it, it just really so, drives quality out. So just a quick point on that. The problem I have with aesthetic is that there are people in the world for whom this is aesthetically better. <laughs> I mean, as obviously as indicated by the majority of Erlang code in the world, that there's something aesthetically pleasing about writing code that's unintelligible. There's like a, like a panache, like, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's my code. Like, <laughs> like, like, you're proud of that. So, so, but here's my, so, so here's my statement, this is my point. I like the term obviousness, because it tends to, it's sort of a hybrid, of, it's subjective, like, oh yeah, it's totally obvious. Uh, for most people, that's not going to be obvious. Aesthetics has little to do with it or cleanliness. I just like, is it obvious? And that is, I think, a more, it's not completely objective, so there's room for debate. And that might, might be the debate that we have with these variable names, but it's my personal preference. So The, 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 the difference is the first one is optimized for writing, and the second one is optimized for maintenance. And what development is only 15% of the cost, and maybe say 5% of the cost. And the reason for the deck aesthetic is because you should be able to judge the quality of a team by looking at the... If, if this guy here opens his screen, I sitting here should be able to make a statement about the team at 10 feet without seeing any of the code. I don't see any variables, I just see the shape of the Erlang yeah, on the page. Yeah, that's exactly right. Tell me what the team you, can, you can tell literally by the shape of the Erlang yeah. what, what's going on here. Flat, nice, nest, non-nested code. I, I was like, I, I don't care if this works or not. I'm just, I'm happy. But this crazy stuff. If you get people to turn their font size to four points and look at the code base at four points, you can tell so much about the team at four points that you can't see that. That's going to be a very interesting website. Point, you're all like, mm. It'd be like a stereogram website to judge, to judge developers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, that's my code as, as a pictorial representation of the code itself. And it's terrible. Snapchat for <laughs> okay, well, thanks for indulging me in this. Uh, any other quick, quick question? Are you telling me that I have? Yes, we have time for one more question. Okay. The problem is there's so many ways to respond to that. I have to pick the right one. It's not it stump me at all. Um, so here's, the th here's, here's my argument. I write a lot less tests but use this method. And I would say that until your code looks like this, you aren't done. You're not done at all. Because the only way that you can prove that this code works is by testing the living daylights out of it. You can't sit and say this is correct. I want my code to be sort of obviously correct at any point at any level. And, and until it is, I'm not done. If I can't, and, and, and this, this sort of, we've, over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, have fallen over to, to tests as being like the way to write code. This test-driven development, you know, let's write tests first. What do you, how do you even begin to know what to test? Like, I, like, I have such a hard time solving problems. Like, getting to work is like, a, just getting it to work at all is a celebration. But then I'm not done. It's like, what am I really, really doing here? And in that process of sort of thinking systematically about it and breaking it down, being able to take something like this and say, what's the story here? What am I really doing? Um, I think to a large extent eliminates the need for, for a lot of testing. Um, I just, I find it goes away. So I wouldn't say that you're done. I wouldn't say that it is, it is sort of a pointless exercise. 
Um, it is to, to give you a chance of writing correct code. Um, and and it, certainly, uh, it certainly is a payoff in terms of maintenance. So if you have any concern about maintenance, uh, and I, I think a lot of people don't care about that, but um, I, I would, maybe I would say forget that. Let's forget maintenance. Let's assume it works forever. Right? You still don't really know that it works until it's, it's just screaming in your face, this is, this is clear and correct. Um, the upside is that you, you do have, you, you can enjoy like very pleasant, enjoyable maintenance after that, but um, I don't know if I've persuaded you, but you don't seem persuaded at all. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is not exactly the point I was trying to make. Uh, the way I feel about this is that uh, writing this code first might not be the best way to go. I mean, uh, maybe. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, I, I misunderstood your point. Start with the code. So, I mean, rejecting the code. Yeah. To, 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 you know, yes, fair enough. So why not just write the correct, perfect code to begin with? That's fair. Um, I, 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 would, I would say that I, in my experience, um, I would never, ever write this now. Just because I've gotten better at thinking like this. I'll start with, I'll start with this. I, I, I've just developed that as a, as a skill uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as I started to use this method. So I tend to write that way f first, right away. Um, but if, you, if, our, if somebody is inclined, sometimes I'll just like, I don't like to use case expressions. I like to refactor those out. Into, but a lot of times it just makes sense. Like I just need to power through this thing and get this behavior working uh, with my, you know, just, just power through it. So it's not to say that you have to write terrible code. It's to say don't put pressure on yourself to get everything correct. You should see the behavior working first. Then you have a chance at understanding what's going on. And then you can make that obvious by the refactoring exercise. If you can get to the, to the good code just in one step, that's awesome. That's Highly recommended. Any other questions? Also, like, uh, uh, I wanted to add uh, that uh, the second variant is easy to trace using MDBG. Right. Yeah, it's similar to Gordon's comment about debugging and, 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 and breakpoints. Um, others would argue it's also easier to test. I mean, you can you can um, you can test each you can test each of these. Um, sort of in isolation, but I don't like to hear that. I just like to say, oh yeah, it's completely correct because I can look at it. But that's, I'm just kind of being in trouble with that. The point. stack traces are 10 times easier. The stack traces from the list. I have line, I, I always turn line, line uh, information off on my, because, you know, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> Who needs a line the number? The stack trace in the list number doesn't make you wish you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would, and that, that previous function. Okay, thanks. I think we're, what is it, time to drink for it? Thank you. Thank you for showing up.